Lounge. We're the show where LeBron James eats at McDonald's, but not at Burger King. My name is Mark Griffin, a.k.a. Montreal Mark. I am joined by my partner in crime, Sporting Phil Foyembola. Hello. And we are speaking LeBron James' indecision 2014. Now, uh, our man, international man of Mystery Moda, is over in Brazil doing the World Cup thing. He's not going to be with us today. So Phil and I are going to go one-on-one talking about the five best case scenarios for Le- LeBron James and where, what he's going to do this offseason. Phil, I, I'm going to throw this to you. We actually work together in the same office, and up until Thursday, I really thought LeBron was going to stay put in Miami. And then, I, to honestly, to, to throw the Star Wars in there, I just felt suddenly this disturbance in the force. And I came over to your desk, and I said, I think LeBron is going to make a major leap. And then the reports started coming out that his agent's talking to four or five teams. Phil, let's start with Miami. What is would make him stay with Pat Riley? Well, look, I I think at the end of the day, Miami is where he would like to end up. I think he would like the cards to fall and not have to jump ship again, but it can't just be Wade and and Bosch, and it can't be bringing in Anthony Morrow, they've been talking about. It has to be a fairly serious piece. Um, I think taking a run at a guy like Eric Bledsoe would make a difference, Um, you know, Monroe from from Detroit, but but they need to shore up that one or the five because they got killed uh, they were last in the league in defensive and offensive rebounds, and their point guard play really let them down. They need young legs. But those players are going to cost upwards of 10, 11, 12 million. So he's basically saying, by him wanting the max, so, so over this whole thing, the one consistent is he's demanded the max. Mm-hmm. And so he's basically calling out Wade and, LeBron, uh, Wade and Bosch to take significant pay cuts. And he's saying, you know what, if you guys want to do this, I'll be back. But if you're not doing this, I'm gone. Well, I mean, uh, one interesting fact I heard the other day, and this kind of blew my mind, LeBron James has been in the NBA for 11 seasons, and in 11 seasons in the league, he's never, ever been the highest paid player on his team. So this is, I mean, unbelievable. I don't mind at all that he's the best player on the planet. I don't mind him at all asking for max money wherever he goes or if he stays in Miami. But the problem is by him asking for so much, it means the other guys have to take a pay cut. So all these names are being thrown out there in free agency because, you know, they're waiting for, for, for the King and for Melo to decide what they're going to do and, and all the other pieces are going to fall into place. Guys like Leo, Leo Dane, you know, these names being thrown around, they would have to take significant pay cuts below what they want to play in Miami with LeBron. So there, there's so many, so much kind of static in the atmosphere right now waiting for what exactly is going to happen here. So Miami's got a lot of question marks. I mean, they, they brought in uh, uh, Shabazz Napier, uh, Napier, uh, who didn't have a great summer league debut. I mean, they've only got one player under contract right now. This is not a good situation for Pat Riley. I mean, I would not want to be in his shoes at all right now. What do you think Miami's going to do over the next few days? I think they're having to make a huge push at uh, – because they just met with uh, the well Dang. And Riley came out – I mean, uh, Dang came out saying, you know, Riley's a really smooth talker. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be tough for him to – for him to ask Wade and Bosch to take less, that's one thing. But for someone who's going into their prime and needing big money or wanting big money at this point, I don't see a lot of these guys taking less. And so, uh, to me, it's it, it's going to be a question. And, and and even now, is Chris Bosch going to take less? There's reports of him wanting max money. I I just think it's a poisonous situation in Miami. And I think LeBron's wise to stay away from it, but... I don't know. I don't see it coming together. Like, I see too many ifs and not enough. Although, when you have to look at that, you have to look at the other situations, right? Because if he's not going to stay there, then where does he go? It has to be a greener pasture. Yeah, absolutely, and that's a good segue. So the next team that's getting a lot of commotion, let's say, is Cleveland. Now, this is he's from Akron, Ohio. Cleveland's the team he played the first several years of his career for. Do you actually think now that the situation has changed, that he'd actually want to return home. Well, I mean, look, he spends almost half the year there with his family. He's built an extension on his house. He's never run away from the city. And one of the hard things that he admitted from the last change was moving the family. I mean, he he went about the decision in his own words very poorly. Uh, But it's moving. He's a big family guy. And I think he likes to be the hometown hero. I I think if if the cards fell where he wanted to, I think Cleveland's the fun place to go into. I I think the only question for them is they're so young. Can they contend right away? They'll have the money for him should they move Jared Jack. But can you really get 
those wings. I mean, Wiggins, great piece, but he's a rookie. Kyrie Irving, they just signed him to a five or ninety million dollar contract. But again, they need that front court help. They have Thompson, Bennett. I I think what's really gonna happen here is we're gonna see a combination of waiters who becomes redundant with Wiggins and one of those front court guys being packed to try to bring in one more established veteran to really make LeBron's mind. Because I think he wants to go there, but wherever he goes, he has to win now. And Cleveland right now, I think that idea is up in the air in his mind. Yeah, I mean, like you said, he has a lot of ties. To, his, his marketing team is still located in the city. Uh, in a lot of ways, he never left Cleveland. Uh, he's got issues with Dan Gilbert. Um, and, you know, for, for me to go to Cleveland, it would be that, that what if. What if I had stayed here? What if I had stayed the home, hometown hero? And there's that story of redemption. But like you said, I don't think that's enough for LeBron James. He's almost 30 years old. You know, he's got to start winning more titles. He, he knows he's, he's working on his legacy. To start over in Cleveland, a team that's so young and has so many young pieces but just not there yet, it's not the right situation for him. You know, I, I, I know he's working on his image and his legacy, but uh, I, I just say I, I think it's a step backwards in the wrong direction, and he's got to move forward. You know, he, he's only got so many years left in this league, and you never know when the legs are going to give. I mean, that's an issue in basketball. I mean, Michael played great till he was 36, but you don't know if LeBron's going to play great till he's 36. So he's got to win now, like you said. And so we got to look at the other situations. I'm going to throw Houston out there. They've got money, they got opportunity, and they got a talented roster. What do you think about the Rockets? Well, they could also potentially have Carmelo Anthony uh, yeah. because uh, one of the side notes is look, if LeBron goes anywhere, that's in, in in my mind. If he doesn't go to Miami or Cleveland or stay in Miami. It's to play with Carmelo Anthony. I mean, it's it, it seems like this this schoolyard kind of uh, picking teams with your friends, but I think if he goes anywhere else, it's to play with Melo. And Houston's one of those teams we saw. We've seen a rumored deal of James Harden for Carmelo, which if I, if I'm the Knicks, I'm loving this. I'm getting younger, re-signed. I can deal with this. But he would then have the man in the middle, Dwight Howard, with Melo, with LeBron, probably lose Parsons at that point, but mm -hmm. you'd still have some nice pieces. I just think that that is a bit of a risk. I mean, wherever he goes is going to be a risk, although he'll play good D, but how does that all fit together? I think Melo's a better passer and team player than he's been allowed to show on the Knicks. He's had to be their scorer. He's shown it a bit more in, in uh, world play, playing for Team USA. But I just, as nice as it is, if he was 25, I'd be like, yeah, I'd do it. But I don't see it as a guarantee. Um and, and there are very few teams that have enough money to bring them in. I mean, you can talk about your OKC's Clippers, San Antonio's, but let's be honest, they can't afford to fork out $22 million. So while Houston's nice, they might have a bit better chance if they land Mellow, or even if they don't with Harden, than Cleveland. But if Cleveland pulls off the right trade, it'll be close. I don't know. I, uh, for me, Houston, it's just going to be a clash of alpha dogs, whoever's going to be there, whether it's Melo, whether it's James Harden, and uh, Dwight Howard, you know, he, he and Steve Nash had issues in terms of, you know, quote-unquote, their dedication to how they play. I think Melo would have issues with some of these guys, and, you know, absolutely he'd be the number one A dog, but I think there'd be a lot of infighting, and, and also, like you mentioned, Chandler Parsons, I think he'd have to leave, you know, it's his money situation, because Melo wants so much in his contract, they're not going to be able to support a guy like Parsons. And he is, to me, along with Nick Batum, the best quote-unquote blue guys in the league. And so if you lose a guy like that, your team chemistry is completely upset. So I do not see this as a great scenario for him at all. And uh, we've got to keep going forward. The, uh, the fourth team out of five is the Lakers that kind of got thrown in the hat uh, kind of last minute. What do you think about him moving to L.A.? Well, it's the same kind of situation. The Lakers have very few players under contract. Um... I mean, they have Steve Nash's contract, which is, we'll see what happens with that. Kobe Bryant, who just got re-signed for his enormous contract. And and Julius Randle, their number one pick, who's the power forward out of uh, Kentucky. So aside from that, they have some money to burn. And you know the Lakers are not afraid to do that. So this is another scenario where they're looking to team up LeBron and Melo with Kobe. I think it's an even worse fit because they're all wing players. And, and we're talking about egos, at least Dwight Howard would have the front court to himself. Now, yeah. uh, you're asking to share, like, a lion share. Like, I just don't see uh, Melo and Kobe existing. Like, well, we've heard other rumors of just Melo going to the Lakers, and even mm -hmm. then, I'm like, I don't really see that happening. But I, I think it's attractive, but I think 
LeBron really wants to solidify his legacy and how people view him. I, I think that matters a lot to him. I think just jumping ship to the biggest stage in the NBA, you know, joining Kobe. Like, if people uh, gave him flack for joining Wade to win a championship, imagine give him how the flack he'll get for joining five-time champion Kobe Bryant. He'll never be seen as the guy who does it on his own. And, you know, uh, that's the one selling point for Cleveland, right? Because if he goes there and brings him a championship, there's no doubt it's him that did that. Yeah. So I... I think while the Lakers, it's Tinseltown, right? It, like it looks nice with all these players, but I, I think it's a bad fit having all your all your money and all your stars in the wings, and I don't think it really translates into the best team even in the West. And so the fifth and final team, and this is my dark horse, is the Phoenix Suns, which have not only a great roster, great culture, but two max positions available. They have money to sign two max players. They're the only team that can offer this to LeBron. What do you think of the chances of Manhattan and Phoenix? Well, it's funny, right? Because um, uh, Eric Bledsoe, people would say uh, they'd have to let him walk because to free up that money for uh, Melo and Car and LeBron. Because uh, so basically, as we said, all these situations that don't involve staying in Miami or Cleveland are involving teaming up Melo and LeBron together. But he is a restricted free agent, Bledsoe. So theoretically, if they sign Melo and LeBron early enough, they could go way over the cap. I don't know if a small team like Phoenix would do that, but they could do that. I think it's an interesting fit. Goran Dragic still is your point guard, so you have that upgrade there. Melo, you're missing some scoring, but I don't know. I, I Every time I see him leaving, I, I look to a team and I'm like, are you the number one contender now? And it's always no. He's going to be an underdog wherever he goes because whether it's the Cleveland, the Houston, especially the Lakers, or the Phoenix Suns, I think they're all playoff teams for sure. And they're all second-round teams. But do you put them in the conversation with OKC, San Antonio, you know? And, and, and those are real conversations. I mean, look, if he stays in the East, he's going to get out of the East. He's a good enough player that he can probably take whatever team he's on and put him on his back. But I think... Phoenix is a fair risk at this point. I, I think it's interesting with so many pieces. People, uh, people forget they have nice center Alex Len, who compares uh, very favorably in a lot of ways to Valanciunas. Uh, so you have your nice point guard. Theoretically, you could trade Bledsoe's rights or anything for some for some pieces. And he has some stretch fours with the Morris twins. Uh, you have some nice pieces. I just not sold that I see it all together. Although, in truth... I'll give you this credit. I see it as a better option than the Lakers. Well, there's a few other names with Phoenix that really make it intriguing. I mean, my, your, your look of like your doppelganger, Miles Plumlee, has been playing great ball there as well. He's a really fast rising center in this league. As well as Tyler Rennes, I thought he was the sneaky great pickup in the draft. I think he'll really uh, fill their system well. Even if they lose Bledsoe, he'll, he'll fill in as a really good backup point guard even from the start. And this is really, really important to me, and it's not discussed enough, is that the Phoenix Suns have the best medical and training staff in professional sports, not just professional basketball. They, Steve Nash has had a, a genetic back dysfunction since his early to mid-20s, and they kept him in prime form, playing there until he was 38. Not only that, Shaquille O'Neal had a few years added to his career when he played for them at the tail end of his career. And also Grant Hill at age 38 and 39 came back and played strong. He was nearly an all-star at the tail end of his career because of what the Phoenix Suns medical staff He was the second team um, all-NBA all defense. defense. He should have been first team. I mean, the, the thing is LeBron James is nearly 30 years old. And if he's looking at Phoenix, and I think he's taking a nice hard look at them, he's got to say they can add a few years, great years, to his career. So that's that's for me is a really important option for him that he's got to look at. Now we just discussed five different teams. If you're LeBron, what do you what's what's your indecision 2014 going to be? To me, unfortunately, all those teams with Melo, I'm waiting on who makes the bigger splash first, Miami or Cleveland. Can Cleveland turn those assets like I spoke of the Waiters, Thompsons, and such? into a front court asset who can win now? Because if you can, I can put up with, with a growing Wiggins and, and Irving. If not, it's the tough pull. I think Riley pulls something out of his hat enough to make him stay, but I think Cleveland's so close. Like, Cleveland has everything, the location, the young players, the, the talent on the wing because of 
Uh, a, a big thing is LeBron wants to limit his minutes. Like, like you're talking about injuries. He wants to not have to play, not have to pick up all the best defensive assignments. So Wiggins can cover a lot of that. He can play some other positions. They have plethora of forwards with Bennett and Thompson. So LeBron James can literally slash his minutes by like five minutes a game and save those, uh, whatever is hurting him at this point. So I think, I think it's a 60-40 Miami-Cleveland right now. I don't really see the others as contenders. I think he's waiting who makes the biggest splash, whether Miami bites the bullet and takes those less contracts, or Cleveland can turn their their young assets into a front-court veteran. I think whoever does that first, he walks to that team. For me, I mean, I, I, I have a feeling Bosch wants big money and he's going to end up at a place like uh, Dallas or Houston. That's going to have a big impact here. I think things are kind of soured between the big three. There, there seems to be miscommunication. And like I said, LeBron wants big money. He wants to go in a direction his career has not been going, really, the last year. I mean, uh, you got to think, if, uh, if Shuttlesworth doesn't make that shot in game six a year ago, I mean, he's, he's got a lot more issues, but he's got issues now from – from losing to uh, the Spurs this season, you know, there's a lot of question marks with his career right now in terms of uh, where he where he ends up on the uh, on the Mount Rushmore. And um, for me, if I, if he's logically thinking, I would go to Phoenix to be honest. But I think he's going to put a lot of emotion into his thoughts and a lot of sentiment into his thoughts. And like you said, family is important to him. I just have a feeling he's going to make a splash and go back. And, and try to be the returning king to Cleveland. That, that's my gut instinct here, and uh, it's going to shake up the league a bit. And I think as you're saying it, I'm starting to, to put like a 55-45. It's getting closer. Uh, but if he leaves, I think Bosch leaves as well. You said Houston makes a lot of sense. But don't discount. There have been some rumors out there that Bosch to Cleveland. I know he didn't want to go last time, but yeah. theoretically that could be the guy that they get if if – if Miami realizes that they're losing the ship and they have to retool, Cleveland has a lot of pieces to retool, so they could theoretically offer those players I mentioned before for a guy like Chris Bosh, bring him in with LeBron, with Kyrie. It's a lot of money for a small team, but it's the price you pay to bring in the king. One last point I have to make here. If LeBron does move, I hope to heck that he stays in the East because the uh, you know, if he's in the West, the East is just going to topple on its head. It already has go been Raptors. in that direction. <laughs> just go Raptors, absolutely. But, you know, all these teams like Orlando will be coming up. But, uh, you know, the NBA, uh, the musical chairs, the coaching – I mean, it's a very similar scenario where the, when the coaching musical chairs started, everyone waited on Stan Van Gundy and Steve Kerr, and then all the other pieces fell into place. Now we're seeing the same exact thing all over again with LeBron and Melo. Everyone's kind of in a holding pattern, waiting, 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 waiting to see what's going to happen. And it's oh, no, a beautiful exactly. thing. Yeah, and I know it's your favorite. It's your favorite time of year. Uh, those are those first two dominoes. As soon as they go, we haven't been hearing about like the Greg Monroe's, Bledsoe's, um, Parsons, uh, Gordon Haywards. There's big, big names who are going to make big, big money. Who are just waiting for this to settle. Then we're going to see where the real fun begins. And so we're going to bring that to you guys next week. Uh, so uh, coming up this week, I'll have a piece. Uh, I think I'm going to call it from Naismith to Nash the Wiggins talking about the. Uh, the interesting history of Canadian basketball. And Phil, what do you have coming up this week? This week I'm going to give a little spin on my usual um, off the wires. Uh, we're going to try to do is bring it to you a little bit more often, a little more condensed. Normally bring you the five articles of that week. What we're going to do is a little more topical, a little more date-oriented. We'll bring you one review on one top story and give you a bunch of links from different sources so you it's one-stop shop. So if it's a topic that's an interest to you, I'll bring you all the info in one spot and give you some commentary. And here and there we'll bring some some guests from outside and writers from hoopslounge.com. So we'll give you very concise uh, and and you know broken down analysis of the of those top stories. And the, the off season just has more and more to bring us. All right, so let's uh, let's wrap it up. Like I said, it's going to be an interesting week, and uh, I I think I think the Kings heading home. All right, guys. <laughs> uh, so join us anytime hoopslounge.com to check out the contributors section. Email, uh, tweet, Facebook, just hit us up. We love talking ball. We'll catch you guys next time on the lounge. See ya.